My name is Evdokia Pitas and I'm a lecturer at the Department of Education, University of Nicosia. Welcome to this session, which is under the Distinguished Speaker Webinar Series on Special and Inclusive Education, organized by the Department of Education of the University of Nicosia. The free webinar series take place online between sept September 21 and June 22. They provide access to leading minds in special and inclusive education and a unique opportunity to learn about the new methodologies, ideas, and practices in the field. The webinars also provide the opportunity to interact with the invited speakers through a synchronous open discussion through YouTube and Facebook chat. So please um, do use this opportunity to post any questions you might, you might have. If you have questions along the way, or the way, please do share them and we will be able to address them at the end. Now, I'd like to introduce today's speaker. Today, we have the greatest pleasure to have an internationally renowned expert in the field, Professor Sharon Vaughn from the University of Texas at Austin to give us a speech on including students with learning difficulties through promoting reading comprehension. Dr. Sharon Vaughn is the Manual Justice and Doubt Chair in Education and the Executive Director of the Middle Center for Preventing Educational Risk, an organized research unit that she founded with a Make-A-Wish gift from the Middle Foundation family. She's the recipient of numerous awards, including the first woman in the history of the University of Texas to receive the Distinguished Faculty and Research Award, the CEC Research Award, the AERA Sikh Distinguished Researcher Award, and the Janet Flishner Award for outstanding contributions in the field of LD from CEC. She is the author of more than 40 books and 350 research articles, six of which have met the World Works Clearing House criteria for their intervention reports. She has conducted technical assistance in literacy to more than 10 countries and 30 state departments of education and has worked as a literacy consultant to more than 50 technical assistance projects. What distinguishes her is her continuous dedication to research and her passion for literacy. Without any further delay, I'd like to welcome Professor Sharon Vaughn. Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. Um, let me be sure I get my slides up here. Okay, and um, thank you so much for inviting me to be part of this group. And it's really an honor to be part of the speaker series for the University of Nicosia. And it's really a fantastic opportunity for the international community to think together about a common issue, which is including students with disabilities. And all of us have a common issue of wanting to promote and enhance reading comprehension to make sure that all of the students, particularly students that have learning difficulties or learning disabilities, are able to understand what they read. And of course, no one does the work that is important to research alone. So I want to recognize my colleagues who contribute to the research that I'm going to be talking about today. And I'm hoping that as I discuss some of these issues related to reading comprehension, that I can do it in an international context in which we can think together about how to better promote understanding and comprehension. So to give you sort of an advanced organizer, some of the key points that I'm going to be talking about today are improving reading comprehension by using explicit and implicit evidence and by recognizing that reading comprehension is, although complex, a multiplicative view of word reading and practice that equals with world knowledge that equals reading comprehension. So we know that many definitions of dyslexia exist. Some of them are international definitions. But specific to the idea of dyslexia is the idea that there is a neurobiological origin and that it, in, it is recognized by accurate or fluent word recognition difficulties, poor spelling and decoding abilities. We know that these particular difficulties manifest 
uh, from a deficit in the phonological component of language that is often unexpected with respect to the cognitive abilities of this individuals with dyslexia. And we also know there's secondary consequences as a result of this, and they influence reading comprehension. So today we're going to focus on that part of the international understanding of dyslexia. And we know that reading comprehension has been a challenge for a long time. And largely it's a function of the fact that reading comprehension, because it's an outcome of word reading and world knowledge, students often have insufficient practice and opportunities to prepare for reading comprehension activities. And we know that reading comprehension today worldwide, not just in the United States, is a function of a rare occurrence of explicit and deep reading comprehension, lack of practice, lack of word reading ability, and challenges with background knowledge that make it difficult to integrate into text reading. So one of the things I just want to think a little bit about as we include students with reading difficulties and learning disabilities into classrooms, this inclusion requires that we think about pressure points in which all students benefit. So we need to look for opportunities to enhance outcomes for students that we are including with disabilities and difficulties, but we also need to think about universal practices that allow us to develop pressure points that affect reading comprehension, that are integral to reading comprehension, vary across individuals, and are potentially malleable for intervention, meaning we, we can actually do things to make a difference. Professor Vaughn, I'm so sorry for interrupting. I think we cannot see your slides. Oh. Yes, I'm so sorry. Well, let's do something about that quickly. Yes. All right. Let's see. Let's go here. And let's do this. OK. Let's do share. We didn't have this trouble when we did our practice, so let's make sure we don't have it today, right? And thank you for interrupting. Let's see, do you think you're gonna be able to see them now? Mm, not yet. Uh-oh. So you still can't see them, because I can see them perfectly. Can you see um, them now? Ah, yes, now yes, we can oh, see beautiful. them now. Well, I apologize, everyone, but let me just quickly summarize that what I did was recognize that I have a lot of um, key personnel who work with me on the studies I'm going to be talking about. I talked, I also, you know, that I thank the University of Nicosia for bringing this international presentation together so we can talk about inclusion and reading comprehension. I talked a little bit about the definition of dyslexia, which is on my slide, and some of the reading comprehension challenges we have. And so up to this point, all of the key points that I made are on my slides, which will be made available through the University of Nicosia so that you can look at them in the near future. So right now I'm at the point in my talk in which I'm actually wondering as we think about these pressure points related to including students and in reading comprehension, that we think about strategy acquisition and that we think about the fact that strategy instruction often includes teaching students to set goals, to monitor these goals, and to use this practice when they interpret their reading. In other words, to sort of wake up to reading. And we have a lot of extensive some studies that demonstrate practices that can be used to do this in inclusive classrooms. We've conducted more than 40 randomized control trials really aimed at improving reading comprehension and in inclusive settings. So before I talk about those, let me sort of set the stage by talking to you about the mean effect sizes for elementary and upper elementary and secondary students. So I'm now talking about students between the ages of about five and eight in the early elementary age and upper grades about nine to about 14. And what I want you to take a look at is in this, on this slide, I summarize effect sizes. And these are effect sizes from multiple intervention studies. 
And in these intervention studies, what you see is that in the first column is the mean effect size, and the second column is the number of effects that contributed to that. And what we see is that in the early elementary grades, effect sizes are associated with greater impact, and it's consistent. So whether it's comprehension, fluency, word reading, or spelling, effect sizes range from 0.34 to 0.56, which is quite robust. These robust effects suggest that between the ages of about five and eight, we have pretty powerful interventions that impact outcomes with respect to fluency, reading comprehension, et cetera. However, take a look at the second column. When we look at the mean effect sizes across multiple studies for students that are older, for example, about age nine to about age 14, you can see that the mean effect sizes are smaller and that they tend to be, when they're in the 0 0.20 and 0 0.20 area, they're related to word reading and spelling. In other words, as students get older, comprehension is more difficult to impact. And we believe the reason for that is because comprehension is so affected by complex vocabulary and background knowledge. So when our students are included in content area instruction, whether it's social studies or science or whatever complex content area they are studying, what we notice is that the vocabulary and density of the ideas, as well as the word reading, inhibit their knowledge and their comprehension. My colleagues and I did a two-year research design aimed at understanding the efficacy of a multi-component intervention aimed very specifically at these older students, meaning nine and 12-year-olds, with the idea of improving reading outcomes for them. We screened all students and students who scored below one standard deviation on a reading comprehension measure were randomly assigned to either one or two years of treatment or a business as usual condition. And what you can see is that in that sample, there are two treatment conditions, one year of comprehension study in, uh, in an intervention of small groups provided by us, meaning the researchers, or two years or typical instruction. So showing you the pretest scores as we get started, you can see that at pretest, all of the students' scores are pretty similar. The green bar represents students in the treatment condition, and the yellow or amber bar represents students in the business as usual condition. And if you look at word reading, you can see that their word reading is slightly higher than their passage comprehension. Although if you look at their sight word efficiency, meaning being able to read words correctly, you can see that it's quite low. And we would anticipate that these kinds of scores across international settings would represent many students who we would typically think of as dyslexia. In the next slide, I'm showing you the intervention components that we organized and wrote for these students to address their reading problems in inclusive settings. And you will see that each of these bars represents one of the components. So we focused on word study, fluency with text, meaning key words and main idea, stretch text. And when we say stretch text, we are referring to text that is more advanced than text students can read independently. So it's stretch text because it's challenging for them. We also tend to focus on content area and information text. The next bar focuses on self-regulation in which we teach students to monitor and regulate their own reading comprehension and to do that with a goal towards improving their own self-regulation and monitoring with respect to their learning goals. And the last bar is essential words. And when we identify essential words, we're talking about those academic words and text-based discourse that help students access interventions. So now I'm going to break each of these intervention examples and provide a, 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 an example of how it is that we teach it. So with word study, 
we use high frequency words, and you can do this in any language, not just English. We focus on vowel combinations because those are the most challenging. And we focus on multisyllable words because, again, those are the most challenging. You may need to adjust the challenge of these words based on the language of origin in which students are learning to read. But in English, this is a pretty good example. And we also teach high frequency words. And high frequency words are important for any language. So we have multiple lists of these high frequency words. And what we try to do is get students to read them quickly and with automaticity so that they own them. And as you will see on our website, which I will provide you at the end of this presentation, all of these word lists are available for you. In addition to word reading, we focus on the fluency within text of words. And this involves what, what we know to be approaches that are associated with improved fluency and comprehension. And that includes modeling fluency, peer reading around fluency, identifying keywords, and main ideas. And so here's an example of how we would do that. The third thing we do is we focus a great deal on intervent on stretch text. And a stretch text is a text in which we number the paragraphs because we want to go back and work with them. And we have text that is derived from the content area that students are learning, whether science or social studies. And we monitor comprehension by identifying keywords, thinking of summaries, and then writing overall summaries of the text. So for example, what is the meaning of flee, F-L-E-E, -E, as it is used here? Read around the word to look for clues to see what it means. Do you know the meaning of any other words? With stretch texts, we engage students in reading the text, reading routines to facilitate comprehension, and students' discussion about text. So I give you a format of one of the lessons we've developed. This one is about ecology. And what you will see is that in this lesson, we identify paragraphs about um, uh, rainforest. And then we ask students to read the paragraphs with our support and then to engage with these paragraphs through specific activities. With stretch text, we also focus a great deal on comprehension monitoring. And one aspect of comprehension monitoring that we have addressed quite consistently is what we think of as, does it make sense? Now, with comprehension monitoring, it's really important that we all think about when students with reading difficulties are in a classroom, what it's like to be asked to think about ideas and to confront text and print that is too difficult for you. And as you think about that, one of the challenging things is not to tune out, meaning to sort of, if you will, go to sleep in the process of learning about this text. So one of the ways we've tried to wake up students to comprehension is we spent a lot of time on activities called DIMS. And DIMS is short for D-I-M-S or does it make sense? And so with compre oops, sorry, with comprehension activities, we would have, for example, a couple of sentences. And we would ask students to read those sentences to themselves, in other words, silently. And as they read them, think about words that make sense. And if the word doesn't make sense, to underline it, and then to replace it with a word that does make sense. So let's do the first one together. My name is Samantha and I love to swim. It is my favorite book. Swimming helps me relax and is a good activity for my health because now I have muscle strength, a healthy heart and healthy lungs. I took classes when I was a child so that I could become a great driver one day. So what you see is that if we ask students to read that and we say, does it make sense? We would expect students to underline in the second sentence the word book. 
it is my favorite book. Well, swimming is not a book. Swimming is a sport or an activity or what they can provide a lot of different words that are successful, but they would underline the word book. Secondly, they would underline in, if you will, the, set, the last sentence, I took classes when I was a child so that I could become a great driver one day. We would want students to recognize that the word driver doesn't make sense in that particular uh, segment and that they would need to replace it with another word. They might replace it with a great swimmer or a great athlete, etc. So we have a lot of these, these does it make sense activities. And actually, students love them. And you can make them up yourself. So you can look at the text in inclusive classrooms and you can either use text at the reading level that students are, or you can use more challenging text. And we know right now, everyone around the world because of the pandemic is struggling to make education more accessible and inclusive for all learners. And one of the ways we are doing that is we are starting where students are and trying to accelerate their um, learning. One way to accelerate their learning around reading comprehension is by using text in the content area. And the reason I keep emphasizing in the content area isn't because I don't value narrative texts or stories, I do, but it's because right now, Content area text and information text is an excellent source of vocabulary and comprehension. And during the pandemic, many of our children need as much access to knowledge and word building as possible. And so does it make sense activities like the one I just showed you can be used by taking social studies and science text from their classroom and make them into short paragraphs. They can even be made into sentences and you can change one or two words. And what that does is it allows students a chance to read carefully and to make sure that they're reading for understanding. Another component of our intervention is self-regulation. And I mentioned to you earlier that self-regulation is really for students to be able to plan and monitor their skills and knowledge, to read words accurately and fluently, and to understand complex text. And there's three main activities as part of self-regulation, goal setting, self-monitoring, and self-reflection. Again, referring back to students who are, have been exposed to the pandemic, many of them are having challenges in school, and one of the ways to assist them is for them to understand that they can regulate their own learning. In other words, they're in control of their learning as much as the teacher or another adult. And one way that to do that is through the three self-regulation activities that I identify here. Asking them to set goals, to monitor access to their goals, and to reflect on whether or not they accessed those goals successfully. So let me give you an example of how we do that, and perhaps some of these ideas could be useful to you. One of the ways we do it is for goal setting is we first provide to students with a process to identify their goals. So in this case, with the students in the group that I'm teaching, I want one of the goals for them to figure out unknown words. So I give them a strategy to think about words they don't know, to underline them, and to read around the word. A second goal they have is to monitor their understanding. In other words, to write key words in the margins that they don't know. That means that they have to be thinking about what they're reading while they're reading so they can identify those words. And we also want them to write for understanding, meaning that they use the words in a summary sentence. We do this self-regulation process so that students become more in control of their own learning. And it, we teach it explicitly with a gradual release of responsibility. What we mean by that is that we, the teacher, at first manages much of the instruction. But over time, we release this so that students become independent in their self-regulation. 
Under the self-monitoring, another part of the self-regulation, we use an approach like this, in which we manage the text length, the vocabulary, and we teach them how to annotate the text by, and also by summarizing. So for example, in this particular text that students are reading called Freaky Forces of Nature, we want them to find keywords, connect the keywords, and stop and think about how to put it all together. So this particular uh, passage, we want them to find a keyword. A keyword would be tornado. Um, and we would ask them to then uh, think about what tornado means. And the explanation is provided in the paragraph and also to put it in their own words. Part of self-regulation is also reflection. So we want students to learn how well they can reflect on what they did. In other words, giving themselves feedback about whether they understand what they read. And here's an example of how we do that. How well did you understand the passage and what happened? And so we want them to answer a question and ask them how confident they are that they are correct. So what this is about is engaging the student in thinking about their work while they're doing it. And this is particularly important in inclusive classrooms where students have to monitor their own learning as well as getting feedback from the teacher. We want them to determine whether they answered how many questions correctly and where they need to go back and reread. So these kinds of prompts are generated as a mechanism for engaging students within their own regulation of what they read. All of this is part of a self-reflection exercise that you can see in this slide. And this self-reflection exercise, based on the result of it, will help students set goals for the future. So what will I do next time? All of this can be done initially orally and then slowly in writing so that students take more responsibility for regulating their comprehension. Another intervention example that I provide from our pillars that, that represent the multi-components intervention that we have so far is essential words. Some people think of essential words as vocabulary. The reason I use the explanation essential words is because we think of these words as being essential in order to understand or learn the, from the text. With these essential words, we have high frequency concepts that are part of a unit. So the way to think about it is this. If you are about to teach a unit in a content area in an inclusive classroom that focuses on science, we ask you to think about the essential word that all students need to learn and understand in order for this unit to make sense to them. So the example I provide here are two essential words. One is interact and the other is ecosystem. Now, what we have learned from research is that when you have these essential words, there are several things that help students make these essential words known to them. First, if possible, find a picture. Second, look for related words. So for example, in the word interact, which is our essential word, the related word is interaction or influence, relate or connect. We also have example usage, some examples of how you would use that word, some non-examples, and an important feature of learning essential words is what we think of as turn and talk. In other words, pairs of students in an inclusive setting turn to each other and talk about that word in their own words. So this is how we teach essential words, and we think it's an important way to make all learning more comprehensible and to provide inclusive practices around content learning. So here are some intervention examples. The essential word for today is persist. Persist is a verb that means to continue to do something despite opposition, warnings, or pleas. Don't give up just because something is tough. Some related words, because remember, when you teach an essential word, it's important to teach related words. A related word is persisted or persistence. 
persistent, persistently, persisting, and persists. And so here are some examples. Must you persist in making that noise? If he persists in studying each day, he's sure to pass the test. She is persistently volunteered at the shelter until all the dogs were adopted. So look for the word persist and its relatives as we read. So we teach an essential word because we're going to read about that essential word. And then, of course, the next paragraph has the word persist in it. So we want to be sure that that is part of students' knowledge. So essential word discussion. How did this text use the idea of persist? Again, turn and talk. And with an inclusive setting, in addition to that, we want to have a whole class discussion. So now that I've told you about the critical elements of the intervention, multi-component intervention that we use, I'm now going to show you what some of the differences were in students who participated. Bear with me a second as I return to a slide in which I show you all of the components one more time. So I'm just going to go backwards. For those of you that get a little seasick when somebody goes backwards with their PowerPoint, don't look. I'm there. You can look now. Open your eyes, intervention components. So as I said, these are all of the components that are part of the intervention that we use to enhance reading comprehension and content learning in inclusive settings. We focus on word study. We focus on fluency with text. We focus on stretch text. We focus on self-regulation. And we focus on essential words. And if it's not too late in the day, all of you will remember that I provided examples of each of these. So now, those of you who get sick with fast forwarding of slides, don't look. I'll tell you when to open your eyes and get ready now. Okay, come back. Here's the new slide. Now I'm going to show you the results of the study in which we used this intervention with students. And what you will see is that we have significant effects on word reading and on fluency. And we also can show you the results from the longitudinal data from years one and two. So if you look at the lines on the line graph, if you look at the beginning of the line graph, the blue line represents the control group. The orange line represents students who were in the condition for one year. And the golden rod line represents students who were in the condition for two years. And what you can see is that older students did make considerable progress, particularly those in the study for two years, around word reading, less so around comprehension. And so what we have as the results is that on average, treatment students outperform students in the business as usual condition by a hedges G of 026. Now, let me take you all the way back to the beginning slide where I showed you what older students, meaning students about ages 9 to 12, um, what their effect sizes were, and they were much lower than 2.6. They, the highest we got was 0.20 across all the studies. So we thought that the standard score points on decoding fluency and reading comprehension suggest very promising findings for this study. So based on that, one of the things we did is we wanted to determine whether students' standard scores on word level um, measures at the beginning of the year prior to the intervention predicted their overall performance in the treatment. So what we did is we looked at students who had very low word reading. And so if you look at their sight word reading, the mean sight word reading is 60.84. That is more than three and a half standard, excuse me, more than two and a half standard deviations, almost three standard deviations below the norm. So these represent students in the first to third percentile, very, very low. I mean, these are students that are actually hard to find because they're so low. Low students are students that are about one and a half standard deviations. These are still students very low. Near adequate, 90, if 100 is the mean, 90 uh, of all students, 90 uh, is still low. But I want you to look at very low, low, and near adequate, because what I want you to see 
is that when it comes to these students' performance on comprehension scores at the end of treatment, look at the students in the very low group and now look at their reading comprehension scores on the gates McGinnity reading comprehension. What you see, which I find very interesting, is that very, very low word readers are associated with much lower passage comprehension than our students who are low or near adequate. And what that means to me is that if you have extremely low word reading, the likelihood that a treatment is going to influence positively your passage comprehension and understanding is much reduced. However, if you have low in the 70s or near adequate in the 90s, your passage comprehension outcomes based on treatment are much more promising. If you look at this line graph, you can see that it illustrates very low, low, and near adequate uh, uh, outcomes from pre to post by cluster. Look at the reading comprehension scores. The dotted line at the top are near adequate readers, and you can see that they make significant gains on reading comprehension on the treatment. And it is all um, the very low students, the very, very low students whose progress is most impaired. This is also true on fluency. Look at those scores. To me, they are really quite illustrative. So I'm going to try to put these ideas together in a way that will be helpful for inclusive classrooms. How do we improve comprehension in inclusive settings? We think that interventions like the one that I presented here will always be necessary. But interventions alone are unlikely to be adequate. What we need are school-wide approaches to enhancing for improving reading comprehension is needed to integrate and enhance what occurs during interventions. Without this enhanced word reading, vocabulary, and those, and by the way, I should say that when I say vocabulary and background knowledge, those really are proxies within school setting for language. And I would bet that during the pandemic, many of our students have had inadequate opportunities to develop vocabulary and background knowledge in ways that contribute to reading comprehension. So we need to really work and think about how to do that. So in an effort to provide some ideas about how we might do this in inclusive settings, particularly within the framework of the pandemic, I suggest the following platforms for us to do. Number one, we need to have organized vocabulary and concept development across the content areas. By content areas, I mean all of the subjects and areas that students are studying. These school-wide approaches to enhancing vocabulary and academic knowledge are essential. I have some ideas about how to do that. Um, and one of the ideas I have is that if each um, school would organize the vocabulary that is essential for each content area at each grade level, then all of the teachers would be reinforcing and supporting those critical words throughout the day. I think it would increase access to that those essential words and the background knowledge that goes with it. Platform number two is purposeful peer interaction. We think that we need to organize opportunities for structured peer pairing and small group work with shared responsibility for learning. This allows all learners to be included. And with all learners included, having responsible roles for accelerating learning, not ways in which one student is doing all the work or two students are doing all of the work, but in which there is shared responsibility for learning. Number three, platform number three is really more reading, just two words. Consider 
ways to increase opportunities to use text as a source of word reading practice and knowledge throughout the day. What I mean by that is right now, in many classrooms around the world, a lot of the heavy lifting around reading is done by the teacher. In other words, people that already know how to read are doing all of the practice reading. Think about that. Is there any activity in which you can get consistently better by having someone else practice? If you want to be a better cook, you have to do the cooking. So it's the same thing with reading. We have to increase opportunities to use text as a source of reading throughout the day, even if it's sentences and paragraphs. Reading is integrated into all learning. You remember that I identified self-regulation as an important aspect of improving access to learning. We think that cognitive self-regulation activities, like the ones that I illustrated to you, are a critical part of completing and enhancing reading comprehension. We think that within the scenario of the pandemic, many students will benefit from opportunities to learn and practice self-regulation. Platform number five, the foundation skills. You'll notice on this slide that I say hugely important. And that's because the foundation skills of word reading and word meaning are essential to our understanding what we're reading. Word reading is the pathway to reading comprehension. Word meaning is the pathway to reading comprehension. Both have to be integrated into all aspects of learning. So, as I start to sort of fold down my presentation today, the takeaway message is significantly improving reading comprehension involves a school-wide platform to improve language and knowledge with ongoing intensive interventions focused primarily at the word level. And by word, I mean being able to read the word and knowing what the words mean. Understanding that reading comprehension is fundamentally a result of knowledge, word reading, and practice and discussing text is the launching pad for reducing the impact of the pandemic and also including all students in education. Noteworthy. All students with reading problems are not the same. Students with near adequate word readings respond very well and may not need extensive interventions. Students with very low word reading are likely to need extensive and customized interventions. We need explicit opportunities for scaffolding these uh, learning opportunities in the classroom by considering some of the questions here. How to support connections and check for understanding so that all students are part of classrooms. And this will involve explicit practice. That means teachers need to talk less so students can do more. Practice reading on the part of the student. Remember, they're not gonna get better if we do the work for them. And of course, explicit practice. Also, feedback. We have to give feedback both instructively and immediately. Engaging the students in the work. As I said several times, if students do the work, they do the learning. And this means we have to provide the modeling, but also give them the opportunities to practice. I added this slide about opportunities for differentiating instruction, because many classroom teachers that are doing inclusive instruction are going to want to know how they do in differentiated instruction. And one of the things we do is we have small groups, not only whole class instruction. We have flexible groups that we change up the membership and that we have opportunities for the instructional materials to be matched to students' abilities, tailoring the instruction to address student needs. I hope that some of the suggestions that I made today, the results of our study, and that some of the activities are beneficial to you. I also provide you my website, and on this website are sample learning materials and activities, 
and all um, we have lesson plans and every single one of the essential components that I talked about has activities and lessons available to you. So please go to the website, take a look, and I hope some of the information I provided is useful. And so I think that we might have, if I'm correct, a few minutes for us to um, answer some questions that are in the chat, if I am correct about that. Yes, Professor Vaughn, thank you very much uh, for sharing this enthusiasm you have about literacy and your expertise on reading comprehension. Um, your speech offered, uh, offered us key takeaways on how to support students with learning difficulties, and you also made clear recommendations on how to, on which strategies to use in order to promote reading comprehension and enhance the overall uh, learning outcomes. So thank you very much for this highly informative and very practical um, talk. Um, from the comments and questions uh, we received, uh, it's evident that attendees agree with me. Um, I would like to, before we go on to the chat, uh, to the chat questions, I have a summary um, type of question I would like to ask. Um, what are the most important elements, so the essential elements of these instructional practices that you shared with us today? Um, thank you for asking and thank you for your kind comments. And also thank you again for inviting me. Um, I really appreciate it. Um, I would say some of the key ideas are that um, students with uh, can be included in almost all content areas. And they can be included if we make um, adjustments. And many of the adjustments that teachers make um, really need to focus both on teaching students how to access and uh, text but I really think a takeaway message is that they can use that does it make sense activity. And that does it make sense activity can be used across content areas. And I really want to encourage the listeners to kind of think to themselves, could I do this? Or is this only, is this difficult? And the answer is, honestly, you can teach your teachers to do it. Or if you're a teacher yourself, I promise you can do it. It is not very hard. You can take the text that you are teaching, and no matter what the content or topic is, and you can uh, cut it into pieces, like the pieces can be sentences, brief paragraphs, or longer paragraphs. And you can just look for, initially look for like a noun, and remove the noun, and replace it with a noun that doesn't make sense. And the students love doing this. It's almost like an exploration, where they get a chance to kind of like a solving a mystery where they can sort of figure out if they can find the word or words that don't make sense. So, and it really improves comprehension. So I hope that that will be one of the takeaway messages. And excuse me for going on, but that was such a good question. I wanna just say one more thing. I really hope that people that are listening are thinking a little bit about self-regulation. And I hope that they are saying to themselves, I wonder how I can integrate that a little more in the work that I'm doing. And I imagine because I, uh, it's, a uh, it's an international community, I bet there are people that have really good ideas about both of those things. Yes, thank you very much. Absolutely. Um, this type of uh, strategies do have um, educational implications and do add to the educational success of, uh, of students with learning difficulties. And one more question before we move to the chat. Um, what should we be more focusing on, do you think, um, as we move on from the literacy classroom to the content knowledge classroom? Yeah. Well, I mean, I think, I, I think this could be true internationally, but I can tell you my experience and the international community can say, oh yes, that's true here too. In my experience, one of the biggest challenges moving into content areas is that content area teachers are experts in their area, like they are experts in history, or they are experts in biology, or they are experts in economics, but they do not consider themselves experts in teaching students with learning difficulties. Mm -hmm. In fact, many of them kind of think, oh, those are not the students that I want to focus on. 
And so we have to think of ways to encourage teachers to realize that every single student who walks through the door is their student. And each one of them has an opportunity to learn and be successful. And the very best teachers teach universally in a way in which access to learning is available for every learner. And sometimes these are fairly minor adjustments. They don't have to be like a big uh, adjustment. But minor adjustments of inclusion really make a difference. So I don't know if that's helpful, but that is the way I think about it. Yes, um, this certainly sheds light on the connection between literacy and uh, content knowledge. So thank you very much. So I've noted down the questions from the chat. One question we have is, um, can you differentiate reading around the words from the multi-queuing strategy? Oh, thank you for asking. <laughs> so one of the things I want to be perfectly clear about is that there is no evidence that I am aware of or any other reading uh, scientist is aware of that uh, suggests that guessing is helpful to teaching students to read. So many people interpret the multiple cueing system as having an element of guessing. And that is not associated with improved reading. When you read around the word, what you do is you are reading the text around the word in order to better understand what the word means. Now, when it comes to reading what the word actually is, like, like reading the word, then you have to use what you know about the phonics elements in order to read that word or what you know from related words. So I am so glad whoever asked that question, it's an excellent question. And it's an excellent question because there's a difference between word meaning and word reading. And when you read around the word, you're reading around the word in order to get word meaning, not word reading. So thank you for that question. I hope that aligns with your own thinking. Yes, it's very interesting um, how, how we relate word meaning with word reading. And you said before that um, word reading is like is um, is very much connected with reading comprehension. Do you think that we can use word reading as a predictor of reading comprehension? Um, yes, I am confident we can. Um, I'm a hundred percent confident, and I'm confident in across languages, not just English. And one of the ways to think about it, a simple way to think about it is that if you speak more than one language, that, um, uh, for example, um, my Spanish is not as good as my English. My English is my best language. And in Spanish, I can say words out loud and I will say them correctly, but I don't understand the meaning of all of those words. And so my comprehension is affected very significantly. And if I can't read the word at all, it's even more affected. So um, both influence, of course, comprehension. And at the early grades, word reading is more important. And the reason it is, is because the complexity of the sentences and the text that children read when they are six and seven is kind of low. But as that complexity gets higher, then the words that are in that text are more difficult and rare. So you are more likely to encounter words that you don't know the meaning than if you're very young. Yeah, um, having said that, Professor Vaughn, um, do you think that this research, this um, research um, results can be transferred to the bilingual classroom as well? Yeah, thank you for asking that too. I have done a lot of work um, with uh, multilingual students, and I have done a lot of work trying to identify practices that are associated with improved uh, outcomes in comprehension for multilingual students. And what I have um, learned is that there are many practices that are universal. And by universal, what I mean is that the impact on the outcome 
for students who are at risk, for students who are English learners, and for typical and high achieving students is about the same. So in other words, it raises outcomes for everyone in the classroom. And these universal practices are being identified and they're very powerful. And I've identified several of them today. So when I looked at those key uh, components to a multi-component intervention or a multi-component comprehension, those components have universal power, meaning that they have been associated with improved outcomes for bilingual students, as well as typical achieving students. And the reason I like that is because it gives us sort of empowers us to encourage teachers across classrooms to use these practices because they benefit so many students. Yeah, it's very, absolutely, I agree. It's very important to make sure that teachers do use this um, um, uh, overall um, universal teaching strategies in their teaching. Um, and one more question that I have here. Um, if we would like to provide a short answer to the question what works, um, what would you say to classroom teachers in regards to interventions? So what works? What would I say? What, yeah, um, what works with interventions? So um, what, um, what works, um, how an intervention worked, um, what factors influence the results uh, to whom this intervention is effective or not Ooh. in regard to the interventions you described earlier on? Oh, boy. That's, that's a big question, and it's a hard question. Does anybody have any easy questions? I'm just kidding. I will try to answer it. So here are a few things I know. Not everything, but a few things. One thing I know for sure explicit instruction is the secret sauce to universal success in teaching explicit instruction and if you go to my website that i put up earlier we have a 10 keys document to explicit instruction and in that 10 keys document i identify and provide examples of all of the ways explicit instruction can be integrated into inclusive classrooms. And teachers who teach explicitly raise the water for all of the students in a way that is so empowering. I cannot tell you how convinced I am of its value. And I provide examples and I really want to say that if we can just sort of use and teach teachers to be explicit, that it will make a huge difference. Number two, I really think that we underestimate the importance of acceptance. And what I mean by that is that as teachers, accepting the responsibility for every learner, in which we say to ourselves, every student who's in my class will learn and improve because I am going to dedicate myself to that. Not some of them, not all of them, but two of the students, but 100% of the students are going to benefit. And that, that acceptance comes across in multiple ways. It comes across in the way in which we treat students. It comes across in the way in which we respond to students. It comes across in the way we teach students. And I think with those, those are just two ideas, and I know there are many more, but I think those two are really sort of power sources for us. Thank you for highlighting these uh, factors um, that affect uh, and, and, and ensure the effectiveness of these uh, interventions. Um, and I wish we had, we had more time to continue our discussion, with, but we are near the end. Um, how about ending with one of your favorite um, quotes? Oh, you're the one who found it. So you end with it. Do you have it right there? It's one of my favorite quotes, and she's going to give it. It's so beautiful. Okay, by Frederick Douglass. Once you learn to read, you will be forever free. Okay, so it's one of these uh, very powerful and inspiring quotes that um, I'm very fond of uh, this uh, quote, too. 
and um, our warmest thanks for this uh, stimulating presentation and discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you all once again for joining us. Um, let me now share my screen um, for communicating some information I have. Okay, so um, a recorded version of this webinar will be made available on our website at www.unique.ac.cy slash E2 Series 2021-2022. At this website, you can find more information about those to come, and also you can watch the previous webinars. If you would like to be get, kept up to date with your series, please sign up at the bottom of this web page and you will receive notifications about uh, those to come. And um, our next three webinars will take place between January and March. Um, in January, a world leader in research uh, for inclusion and dyslexia, Professor Gavin Reed, will deliver a speech on learning differences and inclusion, meeting the needs of all. In February, a leading expert on applied behavior analysis, Professor Robert Horner from the University of Oregon will give us a talk on school-wide behavior support. And in March, a specialist on youth and adult support with intellectual and developmental disabilities, Professor Michael Wehmeyer will give us a presentation titled Inclusive education in a strength-based era, mapping the future of the field. You are all, all more than welcome to join us. Thank you again for your active engagement and participation. Professor Vaughan, it was such a great gift having you here with us today. Thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you.